Today is April 29th. My name is A.J. Messer. Uh, we're here talking with Jerry Wiseman, a long-time <coughs> volunteer and producer with the Community Media Center. Uh, Jerry, how are you today? I'm okay for an old geezer. Okay. Um, what I want to start with today is, uh, Jerry, tell me a little about uh, your childhood growing up. Are, are there any um, are there any memories that, uh, that that you just would like to share about uh, your childhood growing up uh, in the UK? I had a very traumatic childhood because when I was five years old and World War II broke out, I and my school were sent away from home from our parents, not knowing where we were going or what was happening. And except for one or two brief visits back, I didn't come home until 1944, and shortly in time for the air raids from the flying bombs or doodle bugs or V-1 rockets that the Germans sent over. So we endured those, and we spent a lot of time every night in the air raid shelters, and then the V-2s came over, which were a missile, which went up, a supersonic missile, which went up, came down, nobody knew it was coming. And uh, it took a while to get over that. In fact, I never have gotten over it. And I've written a book about it. Tell me a little about uh, where, where was the place that they, you know, they, they sent you to be safe? Where, what, what kind of place was that? Well, we were from London, and they sent us to a little racing town called Newmarket. And I was away, my brother and I, I was five, he was 13 my brother Norman, and there was nothing much happening. It was a period called the Phony War. It's called Phony. The Germans were attacking France and Belgium and Holland and Norway, and they left us alone. So I came back after the first few months. Then the bombing started again. In the meantime, my school had moved from Newmarket to a little village called Fordham, or Fordham, in the county of Cambridgeshire, about 18 miles from the city of Cambridge. I stayed with a family who mistreated me, and the first time my mother came to see me, which was a month or two later, she took me home again. And then the air raid started in earnest, and I wasn't there all this time, but there were 57 consecutive nights that we were bombed. After a week or so of this, my mother and sister went, took me to back to Fordham again. My brother had come home in the interim, and we went to, there was an uh, official in each of these communities known as a billeting officer, and he found a house for us to stay, and the lady of the house said, uh, well, I have an evacuee, but you can stay for tonight because he's gone back to London. And he never came back, and I stayed with her for four years. And this was a house like you wouldn't believe, in that there was no running water, there was no indoor toilet, just like Carroll County at that time. Yeah, really. There was no plumbing, there was no heat, and there was no electricity or gas. This was in the country. She lived in this little house, almost rent-free, because she didn't have any money, and she had a compassionate landlady. But we got by. Everything was rationed. Meat, food, meat was rationed. Cheese was rationed. Eggs were okay, because this was the countryside, but everything was rationed except um, bread and vegetables. Can I ask... Um the day-to-day -day life, I mean, I know there, during this entire time, you must have still had, uh, you know, uh, birthdays and holidays and stuff of that nature. What were those, how were those comparable to, um, you know, before the war, uh, after the war? What were those days like, you know, having to deal with what was going on in the world? Was there, was it, was it different? Did it change? Bear in mind, I was away from my family. I saw my mother maybe every other month she came to see me. 
I only saw my father maybe once a year or so. And I'm Jewish, the school was Jewish, the teachers were Jewish, but gradually they went back to London. And so at the end, there was only just a few of us. Um, get, I'm, not, I'm not answering your question, but everything was in short supply. And we didn't really celebrate birthdays. Um, well, my mother sent me some stuff, I'm sure. But the family I live with, the woman I live with was Christian, devout Protestant. And so we used to celebrate Christmas, and I used to have to go, I'm, I'm, but I'm diverging from the subject. Um, we celebrated Christmas holidays, the Easter holidays, and all of the church holidays. That I do remember. Birthdays I don't remember celebrating at all. Okay. And, um... You're going to have to cut some of this. So tell me, uh, you know, at what, at what point did you come over to the States? All right, that's another long story, but my oldest brother, Toby, who is now 91 and lives in Baltimore, during World War II was in the Royal Air Force, and he had the best posting you could possibly have in the world. He spent two years, two years in Nassau. He was sent to the Bahamas while other people you know, were dying. And he visited the United States a number of times. Uh, in 1953, I think it was, he decided to emigrate here. He met a Baltimore girl, moved to Baltimore. Uh, several years later, my mother and sister and I came to visit. And we were going to stay for six months. I knew, okay, since I, all the money I had in the world was about $200, which I brought with me, I knew that was not going to last me for six months. So I was, I got, instead of a tourist visa, I got an immigrant's visa, and so did my sister, which would allow me to work. And I eventually got a, what's called a green card in those days. And how old were you at this point? 22. Okay. And I had worked in a factory as a tailor. And everything that I did in England was by hand, and everything that we did here was by machine, so I couldn't use any of my skills. Cut a minute. I, I've forgotten what your question was. Um, how, you, how you came about uh, coming from the States oh, okay. to So uh, it was terrible. The conditions, it, was a, it literally was a sweatshop where I was working because I was working as a cutter, cutting linings, for clothes, ladies' clothes. And there was no air conditioning, there were no fans, and the windows had to be kept closed. And this is during the Baltimore summer. is intolerable. And so I couldn't stand it. So my brother said to me, I was about 23 then, why don't you get a job as a route salesman? I said, terrific, except I couldn't drive. So I took driving lessons. The day after I got my license, I applied for a job as a bread delivery man with no driving experience at all. And I worked for a company called Bond Bread who were in Baltimore and uh, North Avenue and Harford Road. And I went door to door dr selling bread and buns and donuts. And, and that was my first job as a driver. And that was okay until I ran into a tree and uh, I stopped selling bread. And how, like, um, were there, are there any memories of that job that uh, you can remember, any instances that, uh, you know, you can remember very vividly oh, yeah. that, that happened that you would like to share? Well, I didn't have a car. I lived near uh, Park Circle, and the job was on North Avenue couldn't walk that far, and I had to be at work before the buses started. So I had a co-worker who would sometimes give me a ride, or sometimes I'd hitchhike. And um, the neighborhoods I worked in, by today, I would not work in them because it's too violent, too dangerous, but I was too young and dumb to know. I worked into the projects, I carried a money belt, 
uh, would, would give change and stuff. I had no fear at all because in the 50s, the conditions were different. And one was not, I was not afraid of getting robbed. If I, today, I wouldn't work there unless I had three armed guards with submachine guns. That's how bad it, the neighborhood where I worked was, is now. So um, people were nice to me. I talked funny with this funny English accent, which uh, they seemed to like. Uh, that's all I can think of about that. Um, so, after uh, after uh, you know, bread delivery, uh, what came next? What brought you from Baltimore County to um, uh, eventually Carroll County? Well, I went through a whole series of jobs, and I got married. My first wife died. We lived in Baltimore County. I met my second wife, Martha, and we've been, I've been married for 25 years, fortunately. We had a house in Baltimore County that got too big for me to take care of. I hurt my back and I couldn't take care of the grounds properly. And we discovered this community of 55 and over people in Carroll County. And we moved here and it's, we've been here 10 years now. And it's a very nice community and we like it very much. We like Westminster. A great deal. Carroll County people are very nice. And we like living here. It's a great place. It's, everything is very compact. I mean, the Westminster is very compact. Um, we go to shows at the Arts Council, the high school, Common Ground. I work at Common, worked at Common Ground on the Hill last year. And uh, throughout your life, um, what, uh, what started you into the direction of I started out doing still photography at age about 15. Joined a camera club in England. I came to America, I joined a camera club. And then I got to work a dream job. I worked in a store that was a camera, sporting goods and hobby store in East Baltimore. And I was enthralled. This was the days of brands that are no longer around. Du jour made cameras. and. Sankyo, and there was all these names which are long gone. And I bought a, my first used camera for about $5, an eight millimeter Keystone camera. You had, to, you had to wind it up and you guessed at the exposure. I think I finally bought a meter, but, so I had fun with that. And then as time went by, I went to work for another camera shop and another camera shop, and finally I got to be a camera store owner. And so I always had the latest stuff to play with because I sold it. And, uh, and then when video came out, I dropped all my eight millimeter stuff and went to video, which I am now still doing, except I'm not using a video camera anymore. I'm using a still camera, which has a video capability, which gives me high definition, um, a much better lens than what I had. And so I make films at the drop of a hat. If you'd like to see my hat that I drop, I'll show that to you also. And uh, what, what, what is it about the um, film, and, um, yeah, film and video that, what kept you coming back? Was there something in your childhood that you found fascinating that, you know, the first time you went to like a theater? Or, um, what was it that kept you coming back to, to that hobby? It's been the thing I've always liked. Um, it's, it's, I can't draw and I can't paint, but I can take, I know something about composition. And I went to film school at Towson University at one course a semester for nine years. And I'd still be going, but we moved to Westminster. And I don't feel like commuting back and forth. And so a friend showed me the media center and I said, I'm home, here I am. And I've been, working at the media center as a volunteer for, I don't know, eight, nine years, I suppose. And what I don't do the center of the media center, I put on YouTube. And I have 70 some videos on YouTube. And what are your, you know, how, how much has, has everything changed from when you first began to, to now? Um, what, um, uh, 
were there any any memories of uh, struggles you had starting out versus uh, when you put photos, when you put video together now versus when you first began? You're talking about the editing of a movie? Okay. Getting back to my first camera, a friend and a friend showed me how to develop film, and we developed black and white 120 film in his bedroom, and he put up a, a blackout, and we used soup plates for the developer stop and fixer, and what you did, you once you took the backing paper off the film, you seesawed it like this through the chemicals. And after a certain amount of time, you would you go from the developer to the stop, to the, wa to the fix and the wash. And then we made our own printer. We made our own enlarger. We took the lens from his camera. We used some tin cans we put together. Uh, we had no money. And we used army surplus paper. We bought this only enlarger, this Mickey Mouse enlarger. And we had a safe light. But we didn't have a proper safe light. We used, he had a red sock that we put on a light bulb as our safe light. And when the light burned a hole through his sock, we, we had to stop doing it because it wasn't safe anymore. So that was a black and white, I'll never forget that. I'm still in touch with that friend. He has been in England, and I mean, he's been to America a number of times. I Skyped him about a week ago, talked to him. My oldest and best friend, we've been friends since, well, 1949, 1950. We're still friends. Anyway, as far as the film is concerned, I used to edit 8mm. I, I still have the editor. You, you have two reels, and you, <clears throat> you wind the film through, and you actually cut it where you want to splice it. You splice it either with special tape with holes in it or glue. And I just gave all of that last week to my daughter. And... Uh, I just, you know, when one ended, you, you cut off the bad stuff and you stuck the next one on. And when the iMac first came out, I really was a Mac user, but when I saw the first iMac that had iMovie in it, I bought that iMac because iMovie was so terrific. And then I went from, I went from a video, to eight millimeter video, to, uh, what's the current, I forgot what you call the current one. Digital video. D digital video. <clears throat> and, and then I got better and better at editing after I went to Towson University. I learned how to edit. And now I'm using this um, still camera. And I take the card and I'm using Final Cut, Final Cut Express to edit. And it's certainly a lot simpler than splicing film together with glue. And uh, were there any instances you can recall about um, uh, any movies you were shooting, any um, photos you were taking, any times you, you were out and about? Uh, were there any instances where you may have had difficulties, uh, just dealt with people, dealt with uh, environment, situations, uh, any, any times like that, that that you can recall that you'd like to share? Well, this, yes. My daughter went to American University in Washington, and it was Father's Day, and I, my wife and I went to visit her, and they took me to breakfast. We had, amongst regular breakfast, we had these mimosas, which is what, orange juice and vodka, what a, orange juice and something. So <clears throat> after breakfast, we walked around um, I think it was DuPont Circle. And what year was this? Let's see. What year was that? I don't know. Um, it's now 2013. I don't know. I'm not quite sure. Ellen was still in college. So, uh, 2002, 2003. I'm not really sure. Something like that. So there were some some guys playing music, the black guys playing music, and we just sat there and it was very entertaining. And then the police, a policeman came over 
and said to them, you've got to move along. And I got up and I said to him, we're just enjoying what they're doing, why don't you leave them alone? And he said, he's got an open can of beer there, and somebody else come over and asked them to leave him alone. So then the police calls for backup. And all of a sudden, we're swarms of police. And I protested, and he said to me, you're drunk. I'd had this mimosa. I don't drink. And they started to give us a hard time. So I got out my camera and I started taking pictures, my still camera. And then they got really upset. So they called in a supervisor and everything calmed down. I still have a, that picture of the police harassing these guys. Uh, the, there was a law I read about yesterday that um, filming the police in public is, is, is okay. You can do it. But they didn't know that. So that was, my daughter was afraid I was going to get locked up. And all I did was say, let, let them play this music because we're enjoying it. But they got, they got upset and there must have, there's a whole posse of police showed up just for that. So that was an incident. Uh, I wouldn't care to go over. And uh, was there ever another incident where, um, uh, if you were out and about, uh, you know, taking video, taking photos, um, any other you know, incident where you might have stumbled into trouble or uh, had an issue with? Uh, not that I can think of, not into trouble. Um, I take movies all the time, mostly now with my iPhone, mm -hmm. surreptitiously sometimes. Something happened, um, that sounds a little bizarre. We, had, we were in D.C. again, and we'd been to see, we'd been to see my daughter when she was in college. And we were on the subway, and I went, way on the other side, across the other side of the tracks, well, a couple of kids were fighting, and they were right on the edge, and I got very scared that one was going to shove the other onto the track. And I had my camera, and I thought, I hope nothing happens, but if it does, I'm going to be able to film this. Sounds a little cold-blooded, but I got nothing. Fortunately, they, they didn't fight, and nobody got shoved onto the track. And I couldn't do anything because they were way across the other side. Their parents were ignoring them. And, it was rather a frightening situation, but I was ready just in case, you know. The man's got to do what a man's got to do, right? Okay. So, um, I mean, you said when you when you worked at a uh, photo, uh, the photo store, um, you had been uh, like held up. You had, you know, they were, were they trying? Can you can you kind of? Uh, share that, share that memory. I had this camera shop. And like what year was it that the I opened it. I, I was working there for three years, two, three years, and then they would decide they were going to close it. And I bought it and opened it up in my own name in 1966. <clears throat> I think that year or the following year, somebody came in with a gun to give me the money. After that, I always carried a gun in my pocket. I had one under the counter. And then I opened another store. I wanted to get away from that neighborhood in Randallstown. I opened a store in Randallstown. And my employee got held up, and he quit. I hired somebody else. He got held up, and he quit. And I, I closed the store in Randallstown because I wasn't making any money on two stores. And I always carried this gun. And... You have to remember, in those days, there were no such thing as surveillance cameras. There was no video. So I built a homemade contraption that I could trip, uh, attached to a camera, that I could trip when I closed the drawer behind me. And I kept the drawer open all the time. And I wired, I built my own video, uh, not video, 8mm movie camera contraption and a 35mm this guy came in, and I hadn't installed it, and he held me up. And then I finally got this thing installed, and he came back a few months later. And he came in, as he walked in the door, he had a gun on me. I, I didn't have a chance to do anything. And he said to me, I, got you, I was the one who got you last time. And 
went through my pockets. He took away this 25 caliber pistol I had. And I had the other gun in another room. I had two back rooms. I thought if I have to go in the, this room, I can come out, reach for the gun, and come out shooting. But he made me go in a different room. But what he didn't realize is that I'd taken his picture. And the picture was of him looking right at my camera, which was hidden, with his hand right in my register. And I gave the picture to the police, along with the 8 millimeter film. The picture was printed. It was pub uh, He caught him within a few days. And when they saw this picture, when his lawyer saw this picture with his hand right in my register, and looking at the camera, told him to plea bargain. So he got 15 years. And when we went to trial, the police had lost the 8 millimeter film. And that picture was published the next day in the Baltimore Sun, above the fold, and I still have it. And all you can see are the tips of my fingers, but you can see him looking right at the camera with his hand right in the register. After that, I couldn't take it anymore. I was having post-traumatic stress disorder, probably, and I had nightmares regularly for 30 years after that. So I closed up the business and became a traveling salesman. That was 19, it, it was 1972, mm -hmm. and I don't have nightmares anymore, but I was constantly having nightmares about being held up, shot, robbed. It went on for years and years and years. And a very scary experience. When you switched to traveling sales, uh, was that, I mean, did that ever occur again? Never. One of my, one of the companies I used to buy from offered me a job. And since I'd, I'd had previous experience as an outside salesman, because I forgot to mention, I also sold Hoover vacuum cleaners as a factory rep. And I, I had many years of interior photo, uh, in, in retail photo experience, and I knew all the merchandise, so it was, it was easy. The only thing, I was away from home every other week, which I didn't care for. And uh, that went on for about five years. I really never did door to, oh, uh, well. Oh, traveling sales. Oh, traveling sales, well. I started in 1972. In 1975, I could see the company was having financial problems. And I was offered another job with GAF, where I, I'd be home every night. In the Was I was in the Washington, D.C. area. I sold to every camera store in, in D.C. and all the way around the Beltway. And I, I sold to department stores as well. But this, the products were not very good. And after 150 or 140 years in the retail photo business, this company had sold to Matthew Brady. That's where he got his supplies. After a year working for them, that folded. It wasn't my fault. I had nothing to do with it. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Was there ever an issue? Look, if you make a living by selling stuff, you're not going to disparage what you're selling. But I wouldn't use that film. I would sell it. I mean, I, I sold it, but I only used Kodak film because Kodak film was so much better. And they went out of business, and they deserved to go out of business because their product was, was, was inferior. But when you're selling something, if that's all you got to sell, that's what you sell. And the photo dealer sold it, as a much lower price alternative to Kodak stuff. But it really wasn't very good. But I had it, that's all I could sell, so I sold it. And then moving on from GAF, uh, what, uh, what was next? I went to a franchise show, and I looked around, and I found a quick print company. This was the early beginning of quick print, where you go in and you get a thousand things printed, while you wait till within an hour. And I bought a franchise. And when was, when was this? 1977. Okay. 
It's called Minuteman Press. They're still around. And I opened a store in um, Baltimore Street, uh, right near uh, the block. And I was there for a couple of years. And as soon as I opened business, they started building a subway. And there was no parking anywhere near me, which hurt. And after a couple of years of that, I, was, I could see the writing on the wall, so I sold it and got out. And, uh, was, was anything, did anything happen uh, during the, the lifetime of that business? Or? I worked very hard. I was working seven days a week. Yeah, the, the opening the, the subway was, it was a killer because when you want to pick up a package, you want to leave your car, go and pick it up, and and drive, and they couldn't, there was no parking within several blocks, mm -hmm. so that hurt. It breaks of the game. And then, and then where, then where it came? Then I was offered a job with a business forms company that I had do, doing some printing for. It turned out he was, one of the owners was my former uncle-in-law. And he knew I knew how to sell because I'd, he knew I'd been a salesman. And I knew about printing because I was printing. And so I went to work for them, and I worked for them for 20 years until I retired. And the best job I ever had. And what is it about sales that, uh, that you know, kept you coming back? I like dealing with people. Well, I'll tell you more why I do it. Okay, yeah, uh, so what, what, what kept you coming Are we back? running now? I like people. It's a challenge to me to make a sale. And I always get a little kick out of it, I get a thrill. It doesn't really matter what I'm selling, I just like to do it. I'm not, I don't feel I'm putting over something over on somebody because I'm always honest, always believe in, in honesty. Um, the, custom, the company I dealt with, I worked for for 20 years, they gave me some customers when I started, and I still had a lot of them 20 years later. Even though there'd been a number, in a number of instances, there'd been four, five, six buyers in between. But I always did my best. I always, if I said I'm gonna do something, I always did it, and I did it right away. And one particular customer was a very big customer of mine. They moved from one location to another. And I said to him, I'm glad that you stayed in my territory, and he says, Jerry, wherever I moved, I'd still be in your territory, which made me really feel good. I'd come in, and most, it, they, I had relationships with these people. We used to give away little advertising specialties. They were lifesaver candies. And um, first thing I always did, came in, I gave everybody in the office at least one or two of these candies, and sometimes, People would forget who I was, but they always remember the lifesavers. And I just, I just liked, it was, a, it was a challenge, and for me it was always fun. And I worked on straight commission, so I couldn't goof off, because otherwise I wouldn't get paid, so. But I started doing it when I was 12 years old, and I'm still selling stuff. I'm selling stuff on eBay right, right now. And I just enjoy the interaction with people, I think. All right, well, Jerry, I just want to thank you for uh, your time today and definitely um, look forward to maybe coming back and, and doing another History Project interview because you have so much, so much to tell. Okay. Be glad to.